So today we will talk about the C++ patterns, uh, how we develop non-safety critical applications in BMW. Um, my name is Anton. Uh, this thing doesn't work. Yep, thanks. Um, my name is Anton Yelkin. Uh, I joined a company like BMW almost 10 years ago. I'm currently a principal engineer at BMW Car D in Ulm. Uh, it's like 150 kilometers from here. Uh, when I joined the company, I was mostly doing some navigation projects, uh, many kinds of that. Uh, then a couple of years ago, I co-started uh, the C++ application framework project uh, uh, to promote some kind of code reuse and somewhat uh, an attempt to standardize the software development. Uh, starting this year, I actually switched to another project. I'm now doing a remote software update but uh, the application framework is still in good hands of Sput, uh, guy sitting there. Um, any questions, like third row there, third person. Uh, uh, any questions you can ask me, you can ask him as well. And if you have any further questions, uh, there is my email. You can just write me a message and we can talk. Um, one thing about questions, uh, please uh, wait until the end of the talk. I mean, if you have really urgent questions, you can ask right now, but uh, ideally just, just wait until everything is done. I'm sorry for that. Uh, then, uh, why we are here and what is that all about? Uh, when people uh, hear about automotive software, and usually what they think is something low level, like some controllers, something we can like do bytes and, and so on. This is. Uh, or some, something safety critical like uh, instrument cluster, this is what you see behind your steering wheel or autonomous driving stack. Uh, something uh, like low level and safety critical important for, uh, for the car. And this point of view is reinforced by, by different talks and conferences where people talk about like MISRA standard, AutoZAR and uh, different other scary, scary words. But uh, this is not the only thing which runs in the car, and there is a lot, of, a lot of more. And by giving this talk, I kind of would like to fill the gap and reveal some details how we in BMW use C++ to develop uh, so-called non-safety critical applications. Uh, this is pretty vast topic, and uh, I cannot possibly cover that all today, uh, thus I will focus only on one small piece of that. Uh, but before we go to like, C++ part, I would like to do introduction to the, uh, to the automotive software in general, because probably not all of you are familiar with automotive, what it is, what is there, how it works, and, 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 and so on. So let's, let's start. Uh, what you see here is not a real BMW, this is AI-generated image, uh, but it looks probably like two series coupe. And the question is, what is inside there? Uh, of course, a lot of hardware, like wheels, steering wheel, chairs, computers, and so on. But it also contains a lot of software. And what kind of software is there? Uh, first of all, if we look, Outside the car, there is software which actually in the cloud, so-called off-board software. And the car stays uh, connected to the cloud all the time, mostly unless you are somewhere in the tunnel. And this interaction is uh, highly asynchronous uh, by its nature. It's not like you do a request to the cloud and then you wait for the response. You do a lot of things at the same time. Uh, when we go into the uh, look into the car, 
what we see there is uh, that cars consist of uh, a lot of different computers. We call them ECUs or electronic uh, control units. Like there are many, many of them. And the bigger ones uh, usually run Linux. Like normal Linux, like you have at home, for example. Uh, this, these machines are not much different. Even if we look inside each ECU, we can see that it, it runs uh, like tens and hundreds of applications there. And what I mean, not like Linux itself, but uh, custom applications which BMW developed, which runs on top of that. And each of these applications uh, interact with other applications there. Like inside the same computer, inside the same ECU, in like other ECUs in the car, or also with uh, like services outside the car. Uh, it could be a backend, it could be uh, other cars, environment, uh, traffic lights, anything outside the car. And to sum up, uh, there is a huge web of applications which kind of chaotically interact with each other. And uh, Every software we just seen, like a lot of that, can be split into two major classes. And so it can be safety critical and non-safety critical. And the difference is, so for safety critical software, if it fails, misbehaves, or does something wrong, it can harm you, it can kill you, it can damage the car, damage property. Like consequences of failure are very, very bad. And this is safety critical system. And when we talk about these systems, they usually comply to some stricter regulations like the MISO standard. Uh, they also tend to use uh, older language standards like C++11, maybe 14, maybe 17 now, but uh, the tendency is they are kind of lagging behind uh, the other world, outer world. Um, and other features, for example, you cannot use dynamic memory allocation and your language is pretty limited. On the other hand, uh, a lot of non-safety critical applications don't have these limitations. Uh, from like this point of view, it's more like a desktop application on a web service. You, you don't have any limitation. Uh, so you do, can use new standards, you can do whatever you need. And uh, like currently, uh, uh, what these applications usually do, they usually implement some kind of business logic. And by business logic, I mean not doing some fast Fourier transformation in real-time constraints, but uh, uh, like moving data around, doing something business-oriented. You probably know like how people call Google. Google is a product above moving company. It's basically what uh, non safety critical application does. It gets data, it processes that, and sends it further. Uh, but it is important because it implements what uh, like companies, what BMW is, so it's business logic there. Uh, such software is written in C++. So currently it's C++ 17, but uh, we started to move to CPP 20. And as soon as we have a new newer compiler, you know, it will, basically, we always have the latest standard there. Uh, such kind of applications are usually I.O. bound. They don't do any CPU intense things, calculations, and most of the time they actually idle and do nothing and wait until something happens. Uh, as some examples of such applications are like all the infotainment, everything you see, like navigation map, uh, speech recognition, augmented reality are these kind of applications. So if your speech input doesn't work, car can drive, nothing bad happens. Um, also, like software update is part of, 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 this, uh, kind of this type of applications, different system infrastructure, like all the services which make possible all the IT features there, and also like vehicle information and control, like you can get current time, current temperature, like interior lights, uh, if your lamp doesn't work inside the car, nothing bad happens. On the other hand, like uh, lights outside might be might be a problem. They might be safety critical. Uh, this is kind of short introduction to to the domain, how cars work, what is inside, 
what kind of applications are there. Um, now, uh, I would like to talk a bit about uh, the application framework itself and why we actually need that before we actually go to the C++ code. Uh, as we just learned, uh, there, there is a lot of non-safety critical applications in the car, and from like the high level point of view, they are really different. Like what is common between speech recognition and software update? But uh, the thing is that fundamentally they are built on the same principles. And uh, one of these principles is the asynchronous nature, like dealing with the asynchronous nature of the, of the, of the, of the car. And uh, doing it right is pretty, pretty hard. One of the reasons for that is there is no really standard how people usually address the non, like asynchronous calls methods. You can do callbacks, you can do something else. There is no like industry standard way of, of doing that. And uh, like what, what is the problem here? Aside from like, spending resources and money on reinventing the wheel and like, doing the same over and over again, this is really the communication problem. Uh, so if there is no standard approach, then uh, teams don't share vocabulary, so they speak in different kind of abstractions. Uh, basically, they don't understand each other. And we, uh, this also means they cannot ask for help, and each team is an isolated island and do whatever they want. Uh, to achieve their goal, and they cannot get outside because they cannot just communicate. This also makes hard to onboard people. So you get someone new, and then you need to teach how your team does that, even if the guy or lady did that and like the same thing in different team before. And this is the biggest problem. And why we did the like, application framework? Uh, the main the main reason is that it's in the in everyone's best interest to do like to solve the problem once and hopefully do that well, and then kind of share the solution between within the organization within different teams. And uh, so, the framework is actually that kind of solution because it. Uh, defines uh, like common abstractions, conventions, and basically it, it shapes how applications look like. So frameworks provide like different building blocks and language how to, how to speak and how to do applications. So they establish a common way of doing things, and this also builds up a community. Uh, if you know, like the framework, and different teams can co cooperate and uh, like do beautiful things. So, having such common solution really helps everyone, and this is what we were trying to do. Um, so, when designing. Uh, the APIs or, or abstractions or concepts like to share within the, within the teams, within the organization, uh, we still need to keep in mind that uh, like we are still doing the embedded software. I know I mentioned be before that uh, this kind of applications are like web services, but the biggest difference is uh, like the embedded software. Uh, we have uh, limited resources. I did not say little resources on purpose because the machines are pretty powerful. But the problem is we cannot uh, scale that horizontally or vertically. So when a car is sold, it's sold. You cannot add CPU, you cannot add RAM, you cannot do anything. Uh, that's why it's really important to make software robust so it doesn't crash at runtime because it's really annoying when you are driving and the system reboots. And, uh, 
that's why one of the biggest design goals we had is to kind of design APIs in a way that they are easy to use and hard to misuse. Basically, the idea is to make it harder to make a mistake. Uh, and by doing that, uh, we made some compromises, including performance. So this common thing which we have can be a bit slower than when you do that manually, but you, give, you have this uh, guarantee or some layers which protect you from mistakes. And uh, this is the important thing, I think, in my opinion. Uh, I think this is the last slide before interesting part. Um, uh, basically, what we did, uh, it can be split into different uh, distinct parts. It's uh, business agnostic and business specific code. And the presentation today is mostly about business agnostic code. Uh, this is what we have built on top of uh, like standard C++ uh, to support our needs. So we also internally sometimes call it uh, language extensions. Um, and this is what the rest of the talk will be about. Uh, but there is also a quite big part of business specific code which implements some really, really specific requirements for, for BMW. And yeah, this, this is like intellectual property and cannot be shared. Uh, you see in the picture is how roughly everything looks like. So there is an operating system in the bottom. Then we base our code on different open source libraries like Boost, STL, and others. Then on top of that, we have uh, at least business agnostic or infrastructure code. And then we have parts of business code and different applications on top of that. Okay. Just a small break, and then now there will be a lot of C++ code. Um, so then, how exactly do applications look like? Uh, the major feature of applications which we develop is that they are primarily single-threaded, and yet they can support asynchronous development. Uh, this means that there is one thread, uh, usually called the main thread, and uh, this is the only th thread the application usually needs. Like 95% of the time, the application has only this one thread, which is running, doing stuff, and that's it. Uh, sometimes you actually need to offload some heavy work uh, to a different worker threads, but this is more like an exception. Uh, like in 95% of the time, it's just single-threaded applications. Uh, this is done for different reasons. So I will not go to details right now, but this was like, done on purpose. And I think it, it is a really good choice. And I will show why in, in a moment. And to support actually the asynchronous development, like this uh, calls to, to backend to different serv other services, other applications, uh, we use event loops and the concept of executors. Uh, then, what is an event loop? So the, the idea is that each thread uh, runs uh, somewhat a specialized version of event loop, uh, which supports only one type of events. Uh, these are executable tasks. You probably know like frameworks like Qt and so on, they have different type of events, so we have only one. Uh, it makes things a lot of simpler. And the main idea is that anyone uh, can post a task uh, to, to this event loop, and this is a thread safe operation. And uh, tasks are actually run in a sequence. Uh, there is uh, like pseudocode here, which self is self-explanatory. Uh, while loop is running, we get the next task, and then we execute that. And we do that forever. Like, this is the basic concept of each application we have. Uh, what it means in practice and what benefits does it, gi does it give is uh, that we don't need any explicit thread synchronization. 
because posting a task itself is a threat safe operation. It's ensured by, by the framework, by the code. Uh, and client code doesn't need any mutexes, anything. So he has, uh, the, the code has uh, the APIs to post a task, and this is thread safe, and that's it. Uh, not, there, there is no mutexes in the client code. Of, of course, there are mutexes inside to implement all that, uh, but all the applications don't have any mutexes. No synchronization is required. And this prevents uh, uh, like the whole bunch of problems associated with threads and synchronization. Like no deadlocks, no race conditions, everything is fixed by, by this approach. Uh, uh, then, on top of that, uh, we have a thing called an executor, and this is kind of an access point to an event loop of a specific thread. And this is basically your APIs to, to, to interact with an event loop, so to execute something. Uh, there are some examples here, like you can post a task to the executor to do something, you can post a like, delayed task in ten, to do something in 10 seconds. Uh, there are also uh, different helper functions, like delete your smart pointer later, and, and, and many more. Um, another cool feature of executors is that they can act uh, kind of as a hint where to invoke the result of operation, like its callback. In, in, in this case, uh, like we can calculate something in this particular thread, like which is pointed by executor, or when we subscribe to some event, which can happen at any time, we can specify where exactly, in which thread exactly it will be run. And this is all, as I mentioned, thread safe, and the event handler will be run in the thread uh, bound to this executor. So this is like fundamental building block of, of, of the whole concept. So it says which thread we are running at. Uh, this is kind of shows an example how two threads can communicate. I need to go back a bit. So basically the, the idea is that this, this line, so we get some input and it runs in the current thread. Then we have a thread object, we post a task to this thread and we capture the executor. We kind of save the current thread where we want to run the callback at later. So when we want to send the, the results back. Uh, then this code runs inside the worker thread. You do some computation. It can take uh, seconds, uh, minutes, doesn't matter. At some point you get a value. And what you do, you, you have this captured executor, which refers uh, to the uh, original thread here, and you post the task there. So this is a lambda, and all this code is run in the original thread, the same thread as this one. Uh, this is roughly how communication works and how you can communicate between the threads. As you see, no mutexes and no race conditions here. Um, as you have just seen, uh, this is pretty primitive, and it would be not nice to do that all the time. Uh, that's why uh, nobody really uses executors as they are, like as shown, but uh, they are really a building block which will build more complicated structures on top. Uh, some examples are in this workload, like watchdog, worker threads, uh, asynchronous input-output, futures promises, uh, signal communication, and, and, and different things. Another problem uh, which we are trying to solve 
is to manage object lifetimes. And it's really hard to do, especially when you have an asynchronous system. In this example here, uh, again, you subscribe to some event and you capture this. But the problem is you don't know exactly when this callback is invoked. It can happen that uh, this is invoked when uh, this is not a valid object anymore. And if you don't guard that, uh, you have a crash. And uh, this is against the robustness, like prioritization we spoke about before. Uh, same happens here. So you have some external calls, like IPC, RPC, it doesn't matter. It goes somewhere, you provide a callback, and you don't know when our other party replies. And again, if you don't guard that, uh, this will result in a crash. And from this code, it's not clear if this still exists or not because of the asynchronous nature of the system. Like all the events happen at any time randomly, and it's hard to follow all of that. Uh, how do we solve this problem? Uh, there is a thing called uh, context. It kind of is an extension to the executor, but in addition to the, to the thread, it also captures the lifetime of the object. And the idea here is that if the, uh, the context is destroyed, like you are out of the context, then whatever is uh, like bound to this context becomes void. Uh, for example, uh, for example, here, it's a bit longer, a longer class, but we basically do the same external call as before. And what we do here, what we, do here we bind this lambda to the context. And the difference to the example before, here it is guaranteed that this exists. And the way how it's achieved is so this uh, object here. When uh, my class is destroyed, uh, the object is also destroyed. The context is destroyed. And this means that uh, this lambda here becomes uh, nothing. Even if the call returns later when your object doesn't exist anymore, it will invoke this one, but it will do nothing. So this bind call, what it actually does, it returns a wrapper around the lambda here, which checks if it is safe to invoke, uh, invoke the lambda. So this is, this is how you can guard and prevent problems when some calls happen when you don't expect that. It doesn't work only with, uh, with lambdas, as said here. So uh, these entities which can be uh, guarded by the context are really different. Like subscriptions, your signal will not be invoked, or future continuations. And this is what we will talk about later. Okay. So tired already, boring. If you have the urgent one, you can do that. Otherwise, afterwards. Okay. Just remember the number of the slide. Um, this is the, the final section of, of the presentation, and it's actually how to do asynchronous calls. Bef before that, it was more like a building blocks, like executor and context, uh, the NIs, but they don't do asynchronous co uh, code for you, asynchronous programming. And when you think about the asynchrony, uh, the naive approach is to use callbacks, like, like shown here. Uh, this is a small example. 
uh, like first we get a VIN number. Uh, if you don't know what the VIN number is, uh, this is vehicle identification number, like each car has one, it's unique for, for a car. You, you get that one, you provide a callback. Uh, when, when you get this information, this whole lambda is invoked here. Next, you get some kind of version, it doesn't matter which version. Uh, then you capture this VIN you received before, and then provide the lambda. So when you get a version, you get it here, and then you ask the cloud for an update. And you provide this VIN number and a version, and another callback here. Uh, and you will get back if update is available or not. If update is there, you start doing update to, like, I don't know, software update, map update, doesn't matter. Otherwise, you show to a user that uh, everything is up to date and you can be happy and, and drive forward. Uh, this is kind of works, and this is how code used to look like X years before. It has many, many problems here. Uh, first of all, it's just three asynchronous calls. If you have 10, you will, you will have, oh, sorry, you will have like huge chain of, of callbacks, which is not really nice, and it's hard to read. Another problem here that the VIN number and the version are kind of requested in a sequence. First, you get a VIN number, and then in the callback you get uh, ask for a version. Uh, you can, of course, do them at the same time, but it's more complicated. I will show that later uh, at the end. Um, another problem here is you don't know in which threads the callbacks are run. It really depends on these functions. And as an API users, you want to be precise. You want to know where your callback is run. Otherwise, you, you can get race conditions, so you can access uh, like variable from different thread and, and get a crash. Uh, this is the problem here. Another problem is um, there is no timeout. Like we can assume that these two are like internal, you will get that at some point, but uh, the cloud communication can actually time out and you can actually never get this callback back. That's also the problem, and it's not handled here. Uh, another issue is uh, object lifetime, as we just discussed. Uh, like again, we do a cloud request, and we don't know when cloud decides to reply. Maybe so we do the request, and user actually shuts down the car. Then, while everything is shutting down, cloud decides to reply, but the object is already destroyed and everything crashes. Not nice. And uh, the, the last problem, maybe not the last, but the last I mentioned today is uh, it's not possible to cancel that. As soon as you started the first call, it will go until the end. And this is not always what we want. Uh, this is what I just explained, and um, you know, maybe one, one thing is such kind of structures are usually called a callback hell. It's where you have a callback and a callback and a callback, and it's really hard to manage. And it causes a lot of problems and bugs. Uh, before we go like, further and provide the solution, uh, let's talk a bit about the different approaches how to handle asynchronous code, asynchronous requests. And another approach is so-called uh, futures and promises. Uh, you probably know as the future starting CPP 11. And in, in, like in this, con in this uh, pattern, a future is uh, some kind of future result of the asynchronous operation, and promise is a promise to provide such result. It sounds abstract, but what it actually means, 
feature is uh, like outside facing entity and promises what, what you do inside, the, inside, your, inside your asynchronous call. Um, so a study feature is nice, but it's not designed uh, to be used with event loops. Instead, uh, what we had to do is uh, to implement a better feature, uh, which is specifically designed uh, for such kind of applications or such kind of uses. Uh, first of all, the biggest difference is there, is there are no any blocking operations, because we have only one thread, and you cannot block that thread. Uh, this means there is no get functions or similar functions. Instead, uh, what you can do is you can attach continu continuations to these functions. I will show exactly how it looks like a bit later. And uh, you can also compose uh, these continuations to actually make another future. So this will be shown in the future, uh, in a moment. Um, this is an example uh, how an API which uses uh, features might look like. Uh, it's pretty similar to a standard future, like same concept. Uh, this call, for, for example, uh, promises to deliver a VIN number at some point in the future. And the, the idea here is uh, we never block the main thread because as you know, we have only one thread and it's not desirable to block that thread. Uh, this means such functions can do more or less one of the three things. They can start a worker thread if they need, but this is, uh, should be like a very, very last option because we like to have everything in one thread. Another thing it can do is actually to post uh, the, uh, the task uh, to some executor. It can be executor of the same thread or can, can be a different executor. Or, which happens more often, is uh, wait for like IO, network, IPC, basically what we started the presentation with, applications just wait. And this is what they do most of the time. Uh, in case of get win, num get win it probably will, will do like IPC call and wait for the result. Uh, now, what is a continuation? Because we don't have the get function, uh, we cannot block and actually get the result. But what we can do is you can, we can provide some action uh, which will run when the result is available. And for that, we use the then operator. Like as an example here, we trying to get the VIN number, then uh, when the number is available, uh, we invoke this continuation. So you can see it gets the VIN number, it, it also accepts the context. It defines the thread where we run, uh, like the, the operator here, and also it uh, prevents this from being called if the context is destroyed. What we do next inside, uh, we can also do like, another operation. For example, in this case, also ask cloud uh, for, for get some news for this VIN number. And then, uh, when this is done, when we get the result from the cloud, again, we provide the thread where we want to run the, uh, the continuation and the continuation itself. So in this case, we show like, to the user news about like, their car. Maybe it needs to go to service and, 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 and so on. And you can continue forever. It can be a very long chain. Um, so 
So if I am too fast, please, please let me know, because it could be pretty complicated for the first time you look at that. Um, if, if it's fine, I, I'll continue. So what we have seen now is like chaining of, of uh, asynchronous operations. So you can request something, then when the result is available, you can do something. It, this something can also be asynchronous. Then, when it's ready, you can do something. Then, 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 it can, it can continue forever. Uh, there is also a way to compose such kind of asynchronous operations. And these are four examples here. You can wait until all results are available, like when all. So this combines different futures and returns the one which is uh, fulfilled when all of the arguments are fulfilled. Uh, when any, uh, this is waiting until like, any one or more results are available. Then things like expires in, you can add a timeout uh, for the asynchronous operation. If it does not return in time, it will do something. Uh, the last one, like until done, you actually can repeat the operation if it fails. Uh, surprisingly, a lot of operations fail because of strange reasons, and it's often really need to repeat that. Like cloud is, for example, not very reliable. Okay, um, then then more code. And this is actually the same functionality we had before with callbacks. Uh, this time it's written with, uh, with, with uh, like futures and when all. Uh, what actually happens here? So we have two functions. Both of them return a future. So this promises to deliver VIN number in future. This one promises to deliver version in future. And when both of these promises are fulfilled, then we go here. So this basically happens at the same time. So here uh, we have a tuple of uh, both the results. We get a VIN number and a version here. What we do next, uh, we have uh, this cloud check for update as before, and we pass uh, the VIN number and, uh, and the version. But we wrap that in the expires in. So this, this function also returns the future, but this future is wrapped in another, upper, uh, in the, it has the expiration time. If within 10 seconds uh, this future does not provide the, re the result, it will return an error, basically. Uh, then, when all that completes, this means either we get the result from the backend or 10 seconds passed, we go here. And here we have the result class. If you know Rust, it's basically the same. And the result is an error if the operation timed out. And it's not an error, then it will contain a Boolean uh, which uh, contains if update is available or not. So this is how you check that. Has update. So if there is a proper value, then we pass the value further. So this means we got actually the reply from the callback, uh, from the backend, sorry. Else, uh, the operation timed out. And here we can have error handling and so on. Uh, this actually doesn't, from the first look, doesn't look much simpler than like the first thing with the callbacks. I guess you agree. Uh, but it solves all the issues I mentioned before. Uh, first of all, we can see here like, this happens 
at the same time. Like it's parallel request. You do ask for VIN number and for version at the same time. Then uh, you know exactly in which thread you will get the reply. It's not some random thread which is uh, controlled by the function. This is the thread you specify. So as, as a reminder, context is uh, like a thread plus the lifetime. And the lifetime also means if context is not valid anymore, none of that will continue. It also ensures that objects are alive and you will not access deleted memory. Uh, also, we actually handle a timeout here. So we add a timeout and we don't wait for, for the cloud forever. And it's done in a pretty simple way here, like expires in 10 seconds. That's it. And in this case, there is a way also to cancel that. Maybe it's not so nice, but you can cancel the whole operation by just destroying the context. Uh, this is exactly what I just mentioned. It solves all the issues uh, with the callback code. And as an exercise, uh, this is actually the callback version of that with all the bug fixes fixed. I had to reuse the font size because it doesn't fit the screen and it's not really intended to read. But uh, you need, first of all, read from bottom to up. You need three extra variables, and it really looks more complicated. I hope you agree that it's hard to, harder to read, harder to like, reason about and fix the bugs uh, than in this version. Here you clearly see what happens, that you, you wait for this data to come, then you ask the cloud, and then uh, you display something to a user or react to the, to the timeout. Okay. Does it look scary? No. Anyway, uh, we now have uh, C20 and nice coroutines. And this actually simplifies things a lot and we can get rid of then calls. And the whole thing which was before with this then chain can be replaced by, by that. It's the same when all call, but instead of doing then and continuation, just call wait. And then when the result is available, you go to the next line you again do like expires in cloud, check for update, also call wait, and when this is done, you go here. And the rest, the same, like ifs and checks for timeout and so on. So C20 really makes things shorter and nicer, and you cannot do that with, with callbacks. So if you had callbacks, this would not help. And I think we are kind of done. It's a bit earlier, uh, but I have some more slides there. Uh, first of all, some words about the company. Uh, so if you liked or didn't, if you liked what I have shown or didn't like and want to fix it, so you're welcome to join us. Um, it's like 150 kilometers from here. It's like part of BMW. It's not, not, it's kind of separate company, but it's part of BMW. And there is a link uh, to, to the career portal, portal if you're interested. And then actually the pretty important question here. Uh, we have been developing this for, I don't know, 
four plus years and uh, we have an idea to open source that. But you all know that management does like that and we need to convince managers to actually do that. And for that, probably I need your help. If, uh, if you have some like, arguments for open sourcing, please, please approach me. We can discuss that. Um, I just mentioned only a small part of what we have there. Uh, like other things are like standard, like logging, quality management, uh, monitoring, uh, life cycle, and IPC interaction, like enumeration, introspection, which is pretty nice. Uh, but uh, to make that all available, uh, we need arguments. So if you have any, anything, please, please let me know. And the, the last slide is, uh, I didn't steal anything, so all images are generated. Code uh, is, not from, uh, is not production code. So it's not the real code from, from the BMWs, you will not see it there. Um, and yeah, we are eight minutes earlier, but yeah, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, so being eight minutes early, of course, means we have eight minutes for questions. Um, I actually have one. Yes. Um, in the uh, coroutines example that you uh, that you showed last, um, I think it was 36. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This one. Uh, what happened to the context? Uh, this one I don't know yet. This is not implemented yet. <laughs> Uh, but hopefully okay. soon. So you can ask this guy, he will be implementing that. Awesome. Okay, <laughs> yeah. thanks. So I saw a couple of hands. Uh, let's start over here and then. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It's me. Uh, I have a question about slide uh, 23 about uh, context objects. Yes. Uh, Oh, no, 25, 25, yes. Uh, 24? Uh, 25. Uh, yes, uh, I'm interested to know how these context objects are implemented to make the uh, callback cancelable in this case. I think I implemented something like this uh, in the past, and in, in my case, I depended on the destruction of the context object, so in that case, uh, I would I would have to put the context object as the last object, uh, as the last member of my object. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to know, do you have some uh, other way to implement when you don't need this, or you just have to make it the last object always? Um, yeah, uh, no, uh, it can be any object. It can be even outside the, uh, the class. I mean, for, for this example, it does make sense, but uh, it does not have to be in a class. It can be your subsystem context and so on. Uh, the way how it's implemented is, um, I will not go into like, two details. It probably can be a separate presentation. Uh, but from the high level point of view, it's somewhat similar to shared and weak pointer. So this is, you can think of, this is a shared pointer and this inside has a weak pointer. And when this is invoked, it checks if the shared pointer still, still exists. But, uh, if it doesn't exist, it will just replace the call to this one to something uh, which does nothing. If a uh, shared pointer exists, it uh, will call that. So basically, there is shared, shared context which is allocated separately. Uh, thank you. But in this case, isn't it possible that uh, M value goes out of scope, like kind of uh, the object of my class already started getting destroyed, but context is still alive if you are just relying on the natural order of destruction. Uh, and then we are accessing M value, which is already destroyed. That's why, I mean, you probably have to put it as the last, unless I misunderstood. Uh, um, this could happen if 
there are threats, but there are no threats. Um, so the destruction will happen in, in, in one thread. So it, it cannot destroy this object from a different thread than it was created in. So by, by doing that, uh, even, so basically dis destruction of the object and this callback cannot happen at the same time. Uh, thank you very much, yeah, that answers my so question. Yeah, this, this solves the issue. Right, uh, we have a couple of more hands. Um, if your question is very technical, consider um, taking it offline. I think it will be available mm -hmm. after the talk so that we can get through the hand queue. I have, I have a question to slide 33. Uh, this one. E yes. Yeah. So I can imagine get win itself, it could be a long uh, task. Is it running in a worker thread or it's running in a main thread? If it is running in a worker thread, can we stop it? Um, there are no threads here, so it's all one thread. Uh, what I was trying to show here, this is, you can think of this one as an IPC call. So you do request to some other service which can provide you a VIN number. A car is kind of this other service you're requesting it sends the request via the network, uh, and then because of the event loop, it just waits. Uh, if, if you know like boost ACO, it's like a similar concept. Mm -hmm. It's like one event loop here, there, and uh, basically f you are waiting f for like the reply, and while doing that, the thread is, is free. So the event loop is free, it, it, it's spinning, and it can do other tasks. Okay, in this case, I cannot, um, so it's not a task, it's not, it cannot be canceled, right, once it's... Um... Um, in this case, no, it can't. So I assume that these operations are more or less rel reliable because it's within the same car. Yeah, maybe you are requesting uh, some other ECU or like other process, mm -hmm. but it's still the same car and uh, you will get the reply. Okay, so there is, there is, there is no like in in in, in like uh, this way, it's not possible to cancel that. Okay, good. Cool. So it will return something at some point. Okay, the second one would be there are two tasks, right? So there's uh, one task is running the check update, and the other one is uh, I think the hash value, and they are also not run in a worker thread. So everything is running in the main thread? Uh, all this code here is running in the main thread. So you check update and what? Uh, you mentioned check update and what second thing? And the, and the second one right, um, is the hash value, right? It's... Uh, this one? Yes. So, one... so, so the, the sequence. First, we do these two calls. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not blocking. So they initiate the request, basically. And then we wait until both replies come back. So when we get a VIN number and a version, we go to this code here. In this code, we call for check update. I will leave this one out for now. So we call for check update uh, with this VIN and version. And this is also our synchronous code. So it goes to the network, to the cloud. And at some point, I don't know, in a second, in two seconds, doesn't matter, it will reply. And then we will end up here. So when reply is there, it's, it's also not, uh, not blocking. So nothing is blocking there. So when you do this call, you immediately return, basically. There is nothing happening. It initiates the operation. Uh, when this is done, we go here, and here we already have the value, and we can check that. So all that happens in the same thread. Uh, there are no worker threads started here. Okay, thank you. I think that answered my question. Sorry? That answered my ah, question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, what happens if an exception is shown in check update or even more fun in get version? Um, so we can talk now about event loops plus exceptions. It can be a long, long thing. Uh, in short, uh, we kind of have a policy no exceptions. But if exception happens uh, and it's not caught inside there, it will actually go to the event loop itself, and there it will be handled. And depending on the strategy, it can either abort everything or just forget about that. So if I understand, you're really going to exit when all then, and the rest of when all will not be um, uh, Okay, maybe to rephrase that. Uh, when exception happens, uh, when this is called and or while the result is being requested on the background. Uh, where? So, um, during this call or later when? It can be check update. I suppose you will handle it in has value, but in get version, you have nothing, so it's going to be hard on that one. So, if this call throws before it returns, then normal rules apply. So, there is no try catch here. It will go down and. So, you exit when all? Yeah. Okay. Maybe there is try try catch uh, like around that. So in, in this in, in this example we don't handle exceptions, but uh, so with event loop and exceptions it's a bit complicated. So what happens if you throw an exception and don't catch that? Uh, in normal case it will uh, uh, like roll out the stack and go back to the main function. And if it reaches main function, it will call as to determinate. If you have an event loop, it will like, go to the event loop at some point, and the event loop catches the exceptions. And what to do there, it really depends. There are different strategies. But um, I, need, I need to ask, uh, you have a result bool. So you check if you have S value. So why not check if you have S ex exception? Uh, come again, please. Um, you get to have the exception check update. So normally, your callback result bool has update will be called, and you can easily have an ex as exception inside and check if there is one, and that's it. Unfortunately, it will not work for get version because the result is only for the second then, not for the first. But if you had result in both, you could handle exceptions. Uh, you mean re like results yes. here, or yes. uh, in the first auto auto res, you make to connect both a result, a result at line two, like you have in line seven. Uh, this, one, this one? Yes, this one you have a result bool. And you yes. check if it has value. Yes. You easily check if it has exception also. Because uh, as so in, 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 in this case, it doesn't have exceptions. So exceptions are not handled like that here. Oh. Uh, but uh, I mean, I mean it's, it's up to your APIs. So whatever this thing internal does, it can catch exceptions and pass it here. Yes. So this is how you define the APIs. Uh, this is what I meant. It's a pretty complicated topic for like event based programming, how to handle exceptions. So if uh, this function or this one inside handles that and catches all the exceptions and returns uh, an error result, then it will be handled here. Yes, but the point is, this result, you have it in the second then. Why not to have it in the first one? Um, Just a suggestion, OK? okay. OK, any more hands? Let's, let's continue here. Um, since you have a framework, do you also have some kind of tracing functionality integrated so that you can see how the callbacks go from which context to which, also for debugging purposes or something like this? Or is this too fancy or future? Or um, it sounds like something which could be done and would be very nice, let's say. Uh, so you can do that, but it's not done because it, is, it will be too much logging. Mm -hmm. It happens a lot, and if you want to log everything, it will be... Yeah, I was not problem. Much of a car, but maybe offline and doing development or so, something could be done. Um, in practice, this can be done, but it's not done because uh, uh, there is no really benefit here, in my opinion. It's pretty low level, 
and uh, can be like a lot of continuations that they go here and there. And if you have logs, uh, it's still hard to understand what's happening. So for some cases, it can be done. Uh, so technically, it's possible. So I don't see any problems with that. Uh, but in my opinion, it doesn't really bring value here. OK. Sput told uh, they tried. So you can ask him what, what they tried. <laughs> Test. Hi, thanks for, for the presentation. So I was wondering, uh, have you considered using uh, actor model for this? So yeah, maybe I can actually stand up. So have you considered using actor model for this? And because to me, it seems like this is a problem of message passing. So you are actually solving. And what I'm actually seeing here, that for example, there is a uh, CAF, C++ actor framework, and uh, it develops all of this. So I'm not sure if you if you know about that, but uh, all of this is actually implemented there. Thank you. Uh, yes, so we know about actor frameworks, uh, and yeah, you're right, it kind of covers that, uh, but it's a bit different way of programming. Um, I would say maybe we just didn't like that. And it changes things a lot. So it, it, it just did, did not show up out of the blue, and we started to use that. It is kind of evolution from what we had before. So there used to be a callback hell, a lot of callbacks, and then we were simplifying that, but not like rewriting the whole thing to the new paradigm. I, I hope uh, this answers the question. But I agree, actors kind of solve this problem. Okay, so one more question over here. Uh, you mentioned that you use uh, like one thread application. In your context, application means process or it's kind of abstraction uh, according to the framework? Because uh, during our development, we had several time solution with several process and we faced the lack of resources to for s switching, let's say, process context. And then we switched to multi-thread application, which th change only thread context. It was cheaper, and we gained some productivity. How you handle this productivity issue? Um, this is one process. So, yeah, there are multiple processes running in, in the system. And each of them are usually having one thread. So we, we, I assume you had problems with the cost of communication between different processes uh, which involved like, changing the context. Um, so yeah, in, in this context, uh, an application is, is a process. So there is one process. Uh, there is also a thing called like worker process. It's like a worker thread, but you start a process instead of a sort of thread. Uh, then an application can have two processes or three, but that's not the norm. Usually uh, it's just one process, uh, there is one loop, and they do communications. Um, actually, a long, long time ago, there, so we used this multi threading approach. But it turned out uh, that uh, a quite large portion of CPU time was spent on context switches, also between threads and so on. Like, and by having only, because before, like if you use standard future, you actually need to start a thread to do the request and then wait for the, for the result. And if you have a lot of requests, you have a lot of threads, and the operating system needs to switch between all the like, thread contexts, and it just kills performance. This is one of the reasons why we opted for like single-threaded applications. But when you have several processes, the problem remains. So uh, not, yes, not but thread context switch, but process context switch. Uh, the thing is, so there is a process, and it used to have, I don't know, 1,000 threads, because it did a lot of communication. And there are like hundreds of processes with thousand threads each. I, I'm a bit exaggerating, but like the, the idea is like that. So we have a lot of threads and a lot of context switch. Now we have just hundred applications, 
one thread in each of them. It's kind of a thousand times less context switch. So this is the, the idea here. Okay, then uh, last question over there, and then I think we're going to wrap it up. What happens to the OS when uh, one of the applications is waiting and doing nothing? I'm sorry? What happens to the OS when one of the applications is just waiting? Um, is it running the other ones, or it is also? I mean, this is just Linux, like whatever Linux does. Like preemptive, I think it's preemptive uh, multitasking. Okay, thank so you. you can check how Linux kernel does that for technical details. So it's normal multi-process operating system, nothing special there. So if one process does nothing, like it's sleeping and operating system executes other ones. Um, yeah, maybe, well, yeah, I, I think, I think we're, we're going to wrap it up here. We already had quite a lot of discussions and I don't want people to get too impatient, but yeah, thanks for the lively discussion. Uh, please, uh, if, if you want to discuss more, stick around a little bit and, and mingle. I think this, this is definitely a topic uh, where we can talk all evening. But uh, yeah, let's give it up for our speaker and, and for this really great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.